and ask it out loud too. So we're glad to have uh, Takumi Moriyama from Princeton visit, well, I guess speaking, not really visiting. We're not glad to have him not visiting, uh, but he'll tell us about growth and localization problem. And, oh, a small thing to mention at the start is that he has a handout which will become relevant at some later point, and it's in Discord, and I'll put it in Zoom as well so you can see. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's very nice to be speaking uh, and, and being back in the Bay Area, although it is virtually. Uh, before I begin, I would like to recognize that I live and work on the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people and to pay respect to the Lenape people's past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Uh, but with that, let me get started with the mathematics. Uh, today, I want to talk about Grotendieck's localization problem. And uh, this is like a very scheme theoretic problem. So I kind of want to just start by giving you what I think are uh, the takeaways for today's talk. Uh, so the takeaways, I think there are at least two. The first one is somewhat surprising, uh, you know, maybe like, is it 60 years after EGA was published? But there are open problems in EGA. And the second one is that um, resolutions of singularities, um, at least when I was learning algebraic geometry, I thought of as like a tool that people use in birational geometry, uh, but they have many applications in scheme theory. So uh, one thing I'll mention right now is that I can see that the screen sharing is a bit laggy. So if it gets too bad, please let me know. So, right, resolution and singularities have fundamental applications to scheme theory. Um, and hopefully you'll see by the end of the talk uh, about how you can use resolutions of singularities and various versions of resolutions um, to help prove things in scheme theory, even if they're not, uh, they don't look obviously related. Um, so let me set some conventions for the rest of the talk. Uh, the first one is that all schemes that I'll run in today will be locally Noetherian. And if you don't like that, you can assume they're even Noetherian. Uh, but you know, everything boils down to the local story, so might as well say what I can say. Um, and I want to set some notation for local rings. Uh, so when I have a local ring, I'll denote it by a comma m comma k where A is the local ring, M is the maximal ideal, and K is the residue field. Okay, so let me let Zoom catch up to that. Uh, but this will simplify the notation later on. So, uh, so that, with that, let me start off with an introduction to the type of problem we'll be thinking about today. Um, so the style of question I'm asking, I think is something that um, it's, you know, very classical in flavor, which is that if you will have a nice family of varieties, we want to ask how the singularities behave in that family. So a special case of this is given a sufficiently nice. And so for example, let's say it's proper and flat. Uh, family of varieties. And I'm going to denote it y to x, although it sounds like that's not what you all at Stanford like doing. And let's suppose I have this family where all the fibers above closed points are smooth. So the question I want to ask is, in this situation, could it magically be the case that the generic fiber ends up being singular? So 
So let me just write down this question that I said out loud. Question, if the closed fibers of F are all smooth, then are all fibers smooth? Okay, so hopefully this question kind of makes sense. You want to ask, you know, if you have this nice family and you, for example, you're working in like some sort of moduli space setting and you know that the closed, fi the closed uh, fibers are all smooth, then can you say something about the generic ones? Um, and um, this is what Grandin and Dudené spent a long time in EGA4 to prove. Um, and so one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that I'm going to be using two screens side by side. Uh, hopefully it will be clear which side I'm talking about. It's the one that's more empty, but I'll just be scrolling on the left or on the right uh, alternatively. So let me state one thing that they prove in EGA4. And this is what proved in part three of EGA4. So you'll see later that depending on which part you look at, they prove different results. But they say yes. The answer is yes. And I'm going to sketch a proof of this for you. Uh, but before I do that, let me recall one definition that's going to help us later on um, in the talk, which is that if you have a finite type scheme over a field, X is smooth over that field if and only if when you take every finite field extension of it, it stays regular. And this is the notion that we're going to end up using for the rest of the talk. So this is why I wanted to highlight this and give it a name. Uh, we call this x is geometrically regular over k. Um, and I want to point out before I move on that this is different from being just regular, right? So not all regular rings are geometrically regular over the field that they're defined over. Um, and this was known, you know, way back when Zariski he first wrote a paper about these different notions of regularity. So this is an example due to Chevalier. That was published by Zariski in 47. If you take k adjoin xy and mod out by this equation y squared plus x to the p minus a, where the characteristic of k is greater than 2 um, and is equal to p, I guess. And A is some element that's in K, but not in its P power subfield, then this is a regular ring, but not geometrically regular. Okay. Um, and so you might ask, how do you see this? You can compute the Jacobian matrix. You get zero here because P um, is zero. Uh, but then you get 2i in the other coordinate. And so the only possible singular point is the origin. You can compute the dimension of the Zariski cotangent space at the origin. It's the correct dimension. So, you know, it's a regular ring, but it's not smooth because the Jacobi matrix has a zero. Okay, is that example all right? Any questions? Okay, uh, with that, let me tell you how you might prove this theorem in EGA4 part three. So we're going to use this characterization of, of geometric of smoothness. Uh, so we're going to show that for every point eta in X and for every finite field extension of the residue field at eta, when you take 
the fiber over eta, and you tensor up by k prime, we want to show this is regular. Right? And so this is the definition, or I guess the alternative characterization of what smoothness means um, in this setting. OK, so let me tell you the idea. Uh, so the idea of proving this in EGA4 part 3 is to kind of do something like the value of criterion. So let me first draw the picture of what's going on. So you have this morphism y to x. Um, and you have two points inside of it. You have the point that you know something over, the closed point. And then you know they have another point that you're interested in. And they're related by the fact that Ada specialized this to that closed one. Um, and so what's the idea? Uh, so the idea in the value of criterion is you kind of probe your base space using DVRs, and that's uh, what we're going to do. So the fact that um, they prove in the course of proving the value of criterion is that in this situation, you can find well, let's just write down what we have so far. We have this map from spec k prime to x, where you just map that closed point uh, to that point that we're interested in, eta. And in fact, you can find a DVR that realizes this. So a is a DVR. And it has k prime equal to the fraction field of a. Uh, this type of scheme is called a trait. Uh, but using this trait, you basically have a smaller space with the same information. You have this closed point that maps the closed point of the original one and the more generic point in the other space. And um, you can pull back the entire diagram. And now we simplified the picture a lot, right? So now instead of the base being this huge scheme, it's now just a spec of a DVR. And you can ask, OK, can it prove it in this case? And that actually suffices because it realizes all the information you want. So let me tell you what's going on now. F prime is still flat. And it has a regular closed fiber, uh, basically by base change. So you have to think a bit about why that's true, but that is the case. And now it suffices to show that if the closed fiber of F prime is regular, then the generic fiber is also regular. Because the field extension we wanted to take is already part of the information of that DVR. All right, are the steps so far OK? We love DVRs. And the claim now is that if a comma m is a local ring and you have a non-zero divisor f inside of its maximal ideal, then a mod f being regular implies that a is regular. And this is because f is part of a regular system parameters. Um, so just a reminder what a regular local ring is, I'll say out loud, uh, local ring of dimension D is regular local if it can be, if the maximum ideal can be generated by the dimension number of elements. And in this case, you just take the D minus one elements that generate the maximum ideal in A mod F, lift them up to A, and then adjoin F. And that gives you this regular system of parameters for A itself. Um, so using this claim, can just apply this claim to the uniformizer of the DVR to get information to lift from the closed fiber to the generic fiber. 
Um, and so this is kind of the archetype of the type of argument you want to do. Kind of want to reduce to the case where we would really understand what the base looks like. You know, I mean, this example is a DVR. Later on, we want to do it with a regular local ring. But in any case, this is how they prove their theorem. All right, is this sketch OK? Any questions? Maybe maybe one question is just to be clear. Regular uh, so a regular system of parameters means regular sequence, right? Uh, it's stronger than a regular sequence. So okay. a regular sequence, you just demand that uh, every time you quotient by something, the next thing remains a non-zero divisor. Uh, but in this case, you actually have to generate the maximum ideal on the nose. Uh, right. So you can imagine that you have a regular sequence that gives you a non-reduced zero-dimensional ring when you quotient everything out by it. So you don't want that to happen. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, with that, let me move on uh, to the, the following question, which I guess I asked when I learned this material is, what is f? is not a finite type. Um, and, you know, I guess as geometers, oftentimes we're only interested about algebraic varieties, which are always a finite type. Uh, but I want to spend a bit of time to explain why we want to think about flat maps that are not a finite type as well. Uh, because I think they really come from, you know, the most basic examples of flat maps. And what I'll say here is that this sort of situation happens a lot when transferring from one world to another. OK, so what do I mean by this? So if you take a polynomial ring, in some number of variables over a field. Uh, let me let Zoom catch up a bit. And I localize um, at the maximum ideal generated by those variables. I can then complete that. And this is a flat map. And it's very much not finite type, right? And you can do the same thing with a slightly larger ring. You can take like conversion power series in that variable. And you can complete it again, and that's also flat. Let me just write down what this is, conversion power series. Can, can you say a little bit more about the thing, these conversion power series? Yes, give oh, me one conversion. second. I see. Oh. Yeah. Um, so I guess, for example, if you have a complex manifold uh, with like holomorphic functions as your structure sheaf, and you just take the stock at a point, that's what I'm talking about. Like the, the, the sheaf, uh, the, what do you call it? The ring of holomorphic functions that converge in a neighborhood of a point or something. I think that's the correct thing. Um, I'm not a complex analytic geometer, so hopefully I got that correct. Uh, but the reason why I'm writing down this example is because uh, this is the original context where flatness was even introduced. Right. So if you look in Sarah's Gaga paper, this is what he is studying. The key information in that paper, in some sense, is that the polynomial ring uh, localized at the maximum ideal and the convergent power series ring both have the same completion, and that's the polynomial power series ring. Um, obviously, there are other examples of flat maps that are not a finite type. Localizations are of this form. And so are the base changes of all these things. Uh, so hopefully this convinces you that even if you are uh, someone that usually cares about algebraic varieties, there are often things you want to do that involve flat morphisms that are not a finite type. OK, any questions about these examples? Was that enough about conversion power series? Would you like to know more about them or? Okay. 
So let me tell you what we can say without finite type hypotheses. So I'm going to write down a version of something that Andre proved in 1974, which is that if you have a flat morphism, uh, again, of locally Noetherian schemes, and you assume that closed points map to closed points, and you assume something else, I'm going to write it in red because there'll be something I explain later. If you look at the completion maps on local rings, these are all geometrically regular. I guess the fibers are geometrically regular. Um, so what Andre proved was that if the closed fibers are geometrically regular, then all fibers are geometrically regular. Okay, so I think I wrote too quickly for Zoom because it's still catching up on my end. Um, but basically this is like a non-finite type version of grand deke and Dirichlet's theorem with this additional assumption that I wrote in red let me give this assumption a name. I'm not going to use this name later on the talk, but just for context, this condition is what uh, is nowadays called being a G ring. Okay, are there any questions about the statement? So I kind of wrote a very general statement. Uh, I just We're skeptical to... of, of uh, is, is this e, is this Eve Andre? Oh, it's Michel André. Aha, uh -huh. OK. Yeah. Uh, the year would seem to be a little bit early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So M André. Maybe I'll write M. Yeah. OK. Um, right. So I guess I want to point out how it's more general than the previous version. I guess it's more special in that you need this G-ring condition. Uh, but the properness got very much weaker, right? We don't need finite typeness. We don't need universally closeness, like closed is enough. And even it's enough for closed points to map to closed points. Um, and let me just point out, why does this extra condition exist what about the completion maps? Um, and it's because, you know, like, many things in this area of commutative algebra and algebraic geometry, Nagata has examples where this sort of theorem fails. So I don't know when Nagata came up with this example, but I got it from his book on local rings. So let's let K be a field again of characteristic P. And let's assume that K is infinite dimensional over its P power subfield. Um, so in particular, it's imperfect. Now gotta look at this type of ring. So it's a sub ring on the formal power series ring. Um, where you say that the coefficients should generate a finite dimensional vector space over k to the p. Okay, so it might not be obvious that this is Noetherian, for example, but it is. Um, and he studied the completion map, which you know, since there's no theory in this flat. Um, it does map the closed point to the closed point, at least on specs, uh, because, you know, the maximum ideal contracts the maximum ideal. And in this setting, the closed fiber is nice. Right, so if you look at the closed fiber, you basically just get an isomorphism of residue fields. And this is geometrically regular. But the generic fiber is very bad. Mm. 
And in fact, in this case, it's not even geometric reduced. Uh, basically, because the extension of fraction fields is purely inseparable. Um, so this ring, or I guess, so this is like the baby example, like, you know, like a flat map, not a finite type, a completion map that is had before is like the basic example of this. Uh, there are examples of Noetherian local rings where if you take the completion, even though the closed fiber is very nice, the generic fiber is very badly behaved. Um, okay, any questions about this example? So, so for the rest of the talk today, I want to talk about how to prove Andre's theorem, uh, not doing what he did, uh, but using alternative techniques. So let me say how Andre proved this. There's one thing. So the, the fraction field in this case is just obtained by inverting x. Is that right? I think it is, yes. OK. All right, um, sorry. So uh, what I want to say about Andre's proof is that uh, Andre and Quillen around the same time invented an Andre Quillen homology. And that was the main aspect of that proof. Um, but today's goal is to give a new proof using a variant of resolution of singularities, which has the adva added advantage of being more flexible. Like it's not just about regular rings. Um, so hopefully this gives you an idea for what's going to happen in the rest of the talk. Um, I'll talk about the general grant localization problem and then try to give a sketch of the proof. Okay. That, let me move on to section two, which is about the problem. Um, and so maybe just before I say what happens, um, I just want to say that this is the approach. Sorry, can I ask one more question? So yes. th this extension from uh, going from frac A up to frac A hat, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's not an algebraic extension, right? That's... And there's all a lot of... Uh, Transcendental stuff in there too. So maybe purely inseparable is the wrong way. Yeah, that what you're yeah that's what's, okay. So you... yeah, maybe I'll just say it's inseparable. <laughs> there's a bunch of things that there's make no, it there's this, Okay, there's this term called primary extension. I wonder if it's that's what. Anyway, oh. don't worry about it. Yeah, I do not know what primary extensions are. So <laughs> okay, uh, yes. So I was saying that right. So you just saw what happened in EGA four part three. What I'm going to do now is show you what they tried to do in EGA4 part two, um, which is more flexible in that it doesn't have finite type assumptions. But you know, of course, in EGA4 three, they have all these Noetherian approximation arguments to go to the non-Noetherian case. So you know, there's some trade-off here. All right. So let me start with the definition. I'm going to be doing this a lot in this talk after this. So if ever I say P. P will be a property of Noetherian local rings. Uh, so I said the assumption that all schemes are locally Noetherian. Uh, so when I say local ring, I'll also mean Noetherian. And let's consider a flat morphism, y to x. Let's call it f. So f is going to be called geometrically p at least in this talk, if 
for all x and x. And for every finite field extension, of the residue field, the local rings of the ground field extension of the fiber over X are P. Uh, so this is the same thing as saying that if you look at the scheme, uh, F inverse X over the residue field is geometrically P. I just wanted to write down the definition again. So as an example, if P is regular and Y to X is flat in a finite type, then Y is smooth over X if and only if uh, this map is geometrically regular. Uh, so I'm going to use this flexibility just to be able to say, like, look, like what we're using is basic properties of uh, properties of Noetherian local rings. It's not something that's particular to regularity, uh, unlike what happened in Andre's proof. Okay, is the definition okay? Um, so one thing I'll point out is that you can ask, like, sometimes when we say geometrically something, we mean you pass to the algebraic closure. The reason we can't do that here is that we're not saying that y to x is a finite type. Uh, so then if you pass the algebraic closure, you might get something non notherian and we don't want to do that. So we put the assumption on all finite algebraic extensions instead. Okay, and so with that definition, I can tell you what Grandi's localization problem asks. Um, so uh, I wrote Andre's theorem in this sort of global setting as morphisms of schemes. Uh, I'm going to write Grandi's localization problem in terms of local rings um, because that's what everything boils down to in the end. So let's consider a flat map of local rings. Um, and I'm going to assume it's local. So I'm not sure how commonplace this terminology is in algebraic geometry, but we're just saying that the maximal ideal should map into the maximal ideal on B. So what Grandi's localization problem asks is if you assume that both the completion map and the closed fiber are geometrically P, Does this imply that the entire map is geometrically P? Um, and I think the naming is a bit mysterious unless you think about uh, the picture a bit. So let me draw the picture again. It's very similar to the first one I drew. You can imagine these local rings as being schemes, the max spec phi uh, connecting the two. And what this is saying is if you assume that over the close point, this is geometrically P, this is property localized on the base. Like is it stable under generalization or generalization depending on your opinion on how we should uh, make generalize or generalize a noun. So if you look at more general points, are these also geometrically P? Um, and um, I wasn't able to figure out who first called it the Grandi localization problem, but um, at least I learned the name from a paper of Avramov and Foxby when they were studying the case when P is Komokalinus. So I'll tell you more about that later. 
Okay, any questions? Okay, uh, so what do we know about this problem? So I'm going to say a few things about what we know, uh, but if you want a more thorough overview, you can look at the handout that I had uh, Ravi send out to everyone. So when is the P is the regular property, this is a theorem of Andre in 74. And when P is normal or reduced, this is a theorem of Nishimura in 81. And all proofs of all three of these things used Andre Kulin homology. So maybe I'll say that this column is going to be the method of proof. Um, and let me just write down the one that I mentioned out loud already. Colmacauliness was settled by Avramov and Foxby in 1994 using a completely different method of what's called Cohen factorizations. So you don't really need to know what Cohen factorizations are uh, because hopefully by the end of the talk, you would know how you can prove it in another way. Uh, but again, my Zoom seems to be lagging a bit, so maybe I'll wait for it to catch up. Um, but on the handout, you can see a bunch of other properties P that you might think about and when uh, the ground delocalization problem holds for those. Okay. Are there any particular properties you would want me to talk about? I tried to choose the ones that I know are in Ravi's notes. <laughs> so maybe people should look at the handout. It sounds like he's actually taking uh, taking suggestions. So yeah, that would be cool. It's OK. I can always just <laughs> point to the handout later. Um, because soon we'll be talking about uh, these properties a bit more. OK. So I think the question I would have when I see a table like this or the table in the handout is what about other P? And the second one is, does there exist a uniform proof? Um, and the punchline is yes, and this will kind of contextualize um, where my mean result fits in in studying this problem. So at least for well-behaved P, I'll explain what well-behaved will mean soon. Grandig and Dudenay prove the cases when the extension of residue fields is finite. Um, or when um, the base ring contains the rational numbers. There's a geometric version. So this includes like finite type, et cetera, assumptions. Uh, this is due to Shimamoto. in 2017. And then I gave a general approach to all of these theorems um, recently. Okay. And so before I state my main result, let me tell you what well-behaved means. So this is funny, I can see myself writing on the screen share. So clearly it's lagging behind. Uh, but yes, what should P satisfy? 
Um, and so for the properties I'm going to write down, we're going to consider local flat maps again, AMK to BNL. And the types of properties we want P to satisfy are that they should behave well under flat maps. Um, and so the first one, for example, is ascent, uh, which is saying that if you know the base ring satisfies P and you know the fibers are geometrically P, you want to say the same thing for the target or yeah, the <laughs> I guess the total space might be the way that you would say it. So if A is P and spec of phi is geometrically P, Than BSP. The second property is a descent property. Um, so one thing that is true about local flat maps is that they're always faithfully flat. So this is a type of faithfully flat descent of properties P. So BSP implies ASP. Uh, the third property I call lifting from Cartier divisors. Uh, this was a suggestion of Kolar. Uh, but, you know, depending on who you are, it looks more like an inversion of a junction type property. So this is terminology from birational geometry, I guess, which says that if A mod T is P for some non-zero divisor T, in the maximal ideal, then A is also P, right? So it's saying that if you have a Cartier divisor that's regular, for example, then your whole space should be regular in the neighborhood at that point. And the fourth one is that this property should localize. So if A is P, then they should be true for all localizations at prime ideals. Um, and as I said, on your handout, you can see known results for all these types of properties. And the highlighted ones are the ones that I was involved in. Uh, some of that was joint with Ronke Adada. Um, so you can see how much fun I had tracking down all the references for these properties P um, and whether they satisfy these four properties. But now I can state my main result. So let's let P be a property of local rings. Again, of they're all Noetherian. Uh, I see myself scrolling, so it's going to take a bit. Uh, and I'm going to make two assumptions about P. The first one is that regular should imply P, uh, just because you know regular rings are the nice ones, and any property of singularity should probably be implied by regular. And the second one is that P should satisfy these four properties that I wrote down. Uh, then. My theorem is that the Grant delocalization problem holds for P. Um, and of course, there's a geometric version. Uh, and the geometric version is that if you have a flat uh, morphism of locally Noetherian schemes mapping close points to close points, and you assume that the completion maps on the base are all geometrically P, and the closed fibers are all P, uh, geometrically P, then all the fibers are geometrically P. 
Um, but in the interest of time, I won't say that explicitly. Just imagine you took Andre's theorem and replaced the word regular with P. Okay, any questions about the theorem? Okay, so in the last uh, 10 or so minutes, I guess there's a bit more, let me tell you what the strategy is. Um, Cause I think this shows you like what uh, the philosophy of how to prove these sorts of statements is. So before we saw the case when X is the spectrum of a DBR. Right, where we used the sort of like lifting property of regularity to lift some information about the closed fiber to the generic fiber. Um, and so we want to do the same thing here. Um, spoilers that we can't assume that the base is a DVR, but we can assume it's a regular local ring in the very end. So I'm going to prove it for a regular local ring. So this also appears in EGA4, part two. It's lemma 7511 if you're interested. So if you have this sort of flat local map of local rings, and P satisfies two of the properties I wrote down there, um, I think I need liftings to number three and number four, the localization pro property. The proposition says if A is regular, and the closed fiber is P, then uh, B is P. And I'm going to write it in the following way. The local rings of B tensor A frac A, so of the generic fiber, are P. OK, uh, so let me let Zoom catch up again. Uh, but basically, this is saying that um, if you don't want geometric properties on the like generic fiber, uh, just the property P itself, and you can assume the base is regular, then it's not too bad to show uh, the mean theorem. So the proof is kind of just repeating the argument for DVRs over and over again, using the fact that it's a regular local ring. So what is the proof? Since it's regular local, we have a regular system of parameters. Um, for the ring. And by assumption, we know that if you tensor by the residue field, which is the same thing as modding out by the extension of M to B, this is P. So this is the assumption. Um, but using property three, we know that if you take out one of the generators of the maximum ideal, this is still P. And you can repeat this over and over again. D times, I think, until you can say B is P. And then going to the local rings of the generic fiber is just a question of localizing more. So that's okay by number four. Okay. So any questions about this special case? Um, so now I guess you can see what the approach one must take is you kind of need to reduce the regular local case somehow. And how do you reduce the regular local case? Well, wouldn't it be nice if we can just replace the base ring with the regular local ring, or at least a regular ring? Um, and that's what resolutions of singularities allow you to do in certain settings. Okay. 
So let me first tell you what you do when A contains the rational numbers. So uh, another way to say this is when A is of equal characteristic zero. So this is in EGA four part two. And I think it's one of the first uh, applications of resolutions of singularities. Uh, so what did Hiranaka prove? So let me state a special case of what he proved. So he proved that if you have a local domain, a comma m, containing the rational numbers, and you also assume that the completion map is geometrically regular, then there exists a proper birational morphism x to spec A, where x is regular and integral. Uh, he proved much more. Like, you know, uh, usually we state it in terms of algebraic varieties. Uh, what he actually showed is that um, I think any algebraic schemes, so like separated finite type scheme uh, over an excellent or quasi excellent local ring containing the rational numbers, any scheme of that sort has a resolution of singularities. Um, and in the interest of time, I was going to sketch the main theorem for you, but I think it's easier to say that you just use this base change to this uh, to x somehow, keep track of the information you're interested in, and this is, ends up being enough to let you reduce the proposition where the base is a regular local ring. Um, but I won't sketch that for you for now. Any questions about Hiranaka's theorem? Okay. So let me tell you the next case, uh, which is that you can do the same trick using alterations instead, at least in special cases. So alterations were proved in De Jong in 1996, where it came out then, which is that x to spec of a above can be chosen to be um, geometrically finite, or sorry, uh, generically finite, as long as a is a finite type over either a field or a DBR. Okay. Um, and so I guess I didn't sketch the proof of the main theorem for you, but basically this tells you that as long as the base is something that's finite type over a field or a DBR, you can use De Jong's theorem instead of resolutions of singularities to give you the same proof. Um, And let me end with what the general case, how you approach it is. Um, so the general case, what you do is you don't have resolutions of singularities uh, necessarily, and alterations might not exist. At least we don't know they uh, exist yet. Uh, but there is a weak replacement for them. Which is called weak local uniformization. So this is a theorem of Gabber, uh, but like many results of Gabber, it appeared um, somewhere else. And what did Gabber show? Uh, Gabber showed that X here uh, might not be one scheme, but you could have a covering in an appropriate Grotnik topology instead.
So I guess, you know, the statement would be that you have uh, for any quasi excellent uh, ring A, you can find some covering in this alteration topology is what it's called, where all the members of that covering are actually regular. So what is this grand D topology generated by? It's generated by et al morphisms uh, and et al coverings, I guess. And all proper um, morphisms mapping generic points to generic points. I think you need the word surjective here as well. I'm just gonna put it there just in case. and such that they are generically finite. Um, and so uh, one disadvantage of this approach is that you don't have one morphism. So you have to kind of keep track of which part of the covering you're living in, uh, but you can keep track of everything correctly and end up giving you a proof very similar to the one that was uh, that occurred in EGA 4.2 um, and you know subsequent um, versions of that proof given by Moreau and also like Hashimoto, at least for this alteration version. Um, but I think I'm out of time. So with that, uh, thank you very much for coming. Great. So we can now